All right. So if you entered the class after one week, after two weeks, I have one student that's just starting now. Um, the assignment is to scroll up. Tell me that I will put you on Google Classroom. I will put you on the contact list. Scroll to the bottom, read everything, listen to the YouTube, right? If you have a question, make an office hour, go to the next one, right? And if you wanna do an office hour before you post, do that. But I think you can get through it. Um, and then you can definitely let me know if you're not getting through the material. So basically it's your responsibility to, um, you know, go through the material. So, all right. Now today we are going to do the second half of utilitarianism. And I've, I hope all of you came with three questions or points that you would want to, okay, um, let's see. So if you can't hear me, let's see. Um, Kanich, do you want to turn on your mic and see if we can hear you? Because as long as you can get into a breakout room and people can hear you, then that's, that's all right. Kanij? I think, Professor, because of brain, it has more noise. Right. So that's why she can't hear you. OK. Um, well, if it gets bad enough, just go ahead in the chat and say, this isn't working. I will watch the YouTube and that's fine. So I've basically counted you present. If you made every effort, right? That's fine. Um, all right. So from now on, you should know the process, right? I, at the end of each class, I introduce new material and at the beginning of the next class, you should come having read it carefully and having prepared three things you want to discuss in a small group. Okay, so Kanich, can you will hear me? No, microphone. I thought so. Okay. Um, so I will, but I will quickly review it right now in case people came without something. That's all right, it's not your fault. Um, and then just while I'm talking, you can think about something you want to say. Um, my main point is that this material is important because it's had such an impact on the formation of Western culture, and then we are exporting that culture. This is, you know, these are the ideals, ideas that have driven colonialism. And so you need, each of you comes from a different country. Your countries have been affected differently. So I want each of you, you know, to have your own view of, of the impact of these ideas on your life or your country's life. But there's also a sense in which these are just philosophical questions that you can ask yourself, like, what do I think about this? Um, so, so this is what I'm going to start out with. We will have um, a breakout session on utilitarianism and on liberty. And then I'll talk about animal rights and we'll have another breakout session on animal rights. And then I'll talk about um, Karl Marx. And there, there won't be a breakout session on that. 
That'll just be introducing you to the new material. Okay, that's what we're going to do today. Um, let me get to the, here we go. All right, so he, the first post is um, Mill's outline. I gave you the, the scientific foundation. They're, they're trying, oh, sorry. They're trying to be um, scientific about this. The, the context was the Industrial Revolution, the scientific uh, explosion. And you can think about how many of the classes that you take right now use science, this kind of modern scientific methodology. How many of them study the natural world out of the context of uh, ecology or the biosphere or the ecosphere? They just study it in a vacuum because that was the original model because you wanna use in order to, the goal is to have power over nature. Um, and Mill was on board with that. Utilitarianism was um, in favor of exploiting nature for human well-being, but they focused on, okay, how are we gonna create a culture that's based on the same methodology, um, science and social science. So studying human beings, and we're gonna study human behavior and we're gonna develop a science of how to condition people so that everybody will be happy, right? Um, all right, they insist on facts. Um, that was, Okay, so the greatest happiness principle. So if you didn't come with anything, think of something you wanna bring up in your group that I'm saying now, right? Um, is, is this a good foundation for society? Happiness, pleasure, and the absence of pain. Is there any other alternative? Um, is it true that all of our beliefs in God are really about our associations with pleasure and pain? It, do you think that our conscience, our sense of right and wrong, is purely a matter of conditioning, right? Or is it partly human nature and partly culture? Or, I mean, that's that would be the alternatives. Obviously, we don't agree, so it couldn't be entirely human nature. But is it a mix of human nature and culture, or is it purely the blank slate? So that's another question. Um, okay, so he's arguing that this is the only possible foundation for society. Do you agree with that? Does the, okay, do you agree that the higher pleasures are actually more pleasant? Do you agree that everyone has been, who has been exposed to both will favor the higher pleasures, right? Okay. Do you think that most people think of happiness as not to expect more from life than it's capable of bestowing, right? Do you think that the, our identification with other people, empathy is natural and it can be the foundation for setting up a society, right? Um, do you think that the reason people seem to prefer lower pleasures is just because they never had a chance to cultivate the higher pleasures? So it's society's fault if they don't. Um, what do you think that what prevents people from being happy is the society that they live in, okay? And this is, again, returning to that higher pleasures 
are more pleasant. Do you think that's true? Um, do you think that the people running the society need to be people who happen to have been conditioned for the higher pleasures like John Stuart Mill? And so they would have the insight to know how to structure education, how to structure um, healthcare, whatever. And they would create, they can socially engineer a society where people are not greedy, that greed, lust, sloth, all those sins of the church are really wiped away through social conditioning. Do you think that's true? All right, that's number one. Number two is um, Bentham. Ben, the, uh, let's see. Okay, the outline on liberty. So John Stuart Mill thinks that these higher pleasures exist, it's provable. So, um, and all, and therefore a free and open society is the best society, right? So the best society is that the only goal for you to, the only reason you can interfere in someone else's life is to protect yourself. You're doing something that hurts other people. You, nobody can interview, interfere in someone's life to protect them, right? They're, you can't say they're hurting themselves. You can't be paternalistic. You have to let people choose, but they have to be mature people, right? They have to seek the higher pleasures. Then they can have freedom of conscience, freedom of thought and, and feeling, freedom of opinion. They can speak publicly on all subjects, right? If given that they're mature, given that the society conditions them to be mature. Okay, let's see. It's important to have a free and open society. It benefits everyone in the long run, but John Stuart Mill says it's unenlightened, right? Any enlightened, mature person knows that people shouldn't be free to raise their children any way they want because then the children won't come out mature and they'll abuse their freedom and everything will fall apart. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that children should be taken out of homes where the parents are not raising them for the higher pleasures, right? Okay, this is the harm caused by intolerance. And you can, um, you can, you can, uh, do you agree with this or not, right? Silencing an opinion robs the human race. Everybody's opinions need to be examined and justified. So forcing your, you know, being forced to explain every opinion you have by somebody else who has a different opinion is a good thing. You shouldn't be threatened by it. Um, we act on the beliefs we think are true. Um, but but we, we have to be publicly accountable to what we think, um, given that most people's judgments aren't that good. It's still, still, there is this preponderance overall. Um, there's a quality of the human mind where people are capable of correcting their mistakes, discussion and experience. Do you think that's true? Do you think wrong opinions gradually yield to fact and argument? Okay. Uh, the relevance in my country right now is, I don't know if you know about QAnon and conspiracy theories and all this stuff, right? 
So Americans have obviously have free speech and freedom of opinion and they're posting all this stuff on Facebook, right? And Facebook even censored, right? They shut down Mr. Trump. Um, but that's this huge issue, right? Freedom of speech. But John Stuart Mill would say these people are not mature. Well, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Tell them you're not mature, Mr. Trump. I'm shutting you down, right? He's not going to think that's a free and open society. So do wrong opinions gradually yield to fact and argument, which is democracy is at stake in my country, right? Are, are enough people going to believe the election was stolen, even though it wasn't? to actually collapse our democracy and destroy free elections? That's, that's the question in my country right now. Now the question to you, each of you are in a different country with a different situation, but I think your, your countries are always wrestling with these same problems. Um, so he's giving this wonderful impassioned argument for the benefit of having a free and open discussion about everything and how harmful intolerance is. All these wonderful people got crucified. But what about Donald Trump and John Stuart Mill, right? They disagree. <laughs> and Donald Trump, well, I mean, when Donald Trump talks about those elites, the elites, the establishment, right? Those are the people that have policies. Those are the people that try to reason with the public. And Trump just, you know, trashes them all. And there's a certain percentage of people that happiness is me wanting to live however I like. I can wear a mask if I want. I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to get vaccinated. I can still go anywhere I want. Um, I can do anything I want. That's happiness. And anything less than that is tyranny. Okay, what are you going to do about that? Mill would not agree with that. But 30% of the people in my country would just call John Stuart Mill one of those awful dictatorial elitists that are trying to tell us what we have to do right? The government is trying to control our breathing. Those elites are trying to control us. So I, I want you to get a sense that people use this kind of language and they use it in a way that John Stuart Mill would not approve, but what can you do about it? So is that true in your country? Are people's ideas of happiness, pleasure and pain, are they enlightened? Are they corrupted? Is it because of lack of education? Is it because of pol political manipulation? Um, things like that. So that's, um, that's Mill. Then Bentham had, um, okay, let me do Traub here. So this is a reminder that, oh, come on, you. It's always worked before. Come on. Okay, whoops. All right, so let me see if I, it'll come through. Oh boy, it's just stuck. Um, all right. I haven't had this happen before, but let's see. Okay, I'll just forget that. There was a, an article saying that Americans' pursuit of happiness is destroying the environment. So what do you think of that? Do you think, is that happen in your country? People are pursuing happiness and they're destroying the environment. All right, so that's one set of questions. Um,
All right, so I'm gonna put you in groups. Is everybody okay with that now? Yes, Professor. Okay, now, are there some people who wanna volunteer to be the leader? So I make sure every group has somebody that's sort of taken it on. You know, they can start the discussion. They have some points they wanna make. Do you want leader, <laughs> volunteer? Yes, well, I need some volunteers. I need, gee, there's only 11 people in the class today. Wow. Yes, then three, three or four people, yeah, one in one group. I can do that. Okay, so there's one. Who else? Somebody else gonna volunteer? Okay, Rossi, I know you can do it. And Shazneen, I know you can do it. I don't mind, Professor. <laughs> what about you, Shazneen? Can I get you? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay, thanks. Um, all right. All right. So let me just run, run this through your head a little bit more. Um, on the one on the one hand, there is this problem that middle finger it's Wait a sec. Who's there? Somebody needs to turn it off. Okay. Nobody's microphone is on. Let's see. Professor, you can mute her. If you want, you can do yeah, that. Okay. Hey, Shamima. Shamima. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Professor. Sorry, Professor. Um, okay. So here's the, the way I want to complicate it. Okay. The first complication is that Mill thought you could prove empirically through scientific method that some pleasures are higher than others. And people would agree that some people were raised that way and those people should lead society, that we are blank slates. We can create this utopian society through social engineering, right? Um, and then we can let each other live however we like, right? Then we get a free and open society. So it has to include removing children from their parents. All right, so um, what has happened? So the question is, is this a good model for environmental protection? Are people going to really listen to that principle of happiness, pleasure, and pain, and think right away, oh yeah, I have to be an environmentalist. Or do people think that uh, politicians who really want to stop climate change, they, they know that every single thing you do does harm or help other people, okay? So in theory, as long as it doesn't harm somebody else, you can do whatever you want. Well, with climate change, almost everything you do harms somebody else and people aren't aware of that. So what if, and this is, this is happening, right? Governments will try to stop plastic. In Europe, they tried to, ban plastic bags. This does not go over very well, right? It made people annoyed. What about if, if uh, companies cannot make uh, fossil fuel vehicles anymore? What if you have to turn your vehicle in? What if you have to get a solar panel on your roof? What if you have to get, you know, all this stuff that really has to change? And the politicians are going to say, but it's, it'll make you happy 
<laughs> and everybody will be happier because every single thing you do affects other people. Um, but you can have a free and open opinion as long as it agrees with the fact that climate change is a big problem. All right, so I don't know about people in your country, people in my country really have a hard time with that, right? They want to keep the government, I'm not hurting anybody, or it's just a bunch of elites and they think it hurts somebody, but that's because they want power. It's just a power grab. They want to steal my money and use taxes to you know, create all this solar panels and all this garbage. And it's all just about power and control. Well, in a free and open society, they can have those opinions and they do. And John Stuart Mill would say, oh, but they're immature people. And I'm like, yeah, who gets to decide? And, you know, are they just going to, you know, lay back and accept that evaluation of them and let somebody come and completely change their life? All right, so that's number one. Will people have a truly enlightened, mature view? Point number two is what this uh, philosophy was used to justify colonialism, right? John Stuart Mill, you know, I just happen to be educated in higher pleasures. Westerners just happen to have a higher level of sophistication. And so we're going to come to your countries and we're going to exploit your resources. And we're also going to, you know, dominate your culture because our culture is better than your culture because we've been able to use natural things and create a higher standard of living. And so we should make all the judgments about what your people should do, right? So uh, every, that's number two. You get your head wrapped around that, that it was used to justify colonialism. So was Aristotle. That was used to justify colonialism. I just am more practically wise than you. Okay, John Locke, I have a right to your land because you're not making use of it and giving it value, right? So all of these opinions, you have to, I want you to be sort of schizophrenic. And the first time around, just think of it in terms of a reasoning process and that you can agree or not, right? Then the second time around, you think, think of it in terms of colonialism, the context. So I do want you to, you know, to see things from these radically different points of view and understand how powerful philosophies are because they have the capacity to either enlighten people or completely pull the wool over their eyes, right? So, um, so it, let's see, just to sort of summarize what we've done, right? This is a big paradigm shift from ancient to modern. And then Locke, okay, so Westerners exported this view that science and religion are totally at odds, or else that Francis Bacon says, science tells you the power of God, and you're supposed to use that power for human well-being. And the Bible tells you the will of God. This is your morality. Um, but... But in scientific method and religious belief are totally different. So we, we split that. There was this big war between the scientists and the church. Bacon said the purpose of knowledge is power. How has that been used to uh, generate? It's generated huge wealth, well-being, but it's also generated environmental destruction. And we we we're so in love with their ideas, we can't adjust to the reality. Then you had Locke's view of property, right? That justified colonialism. That just, that really runs against any kind of environmental protection. 
Then you have Kant and um, his idea of pure reason. That's the engineer's mentality. And that's developed into artificial intelligence and computers. All of that stuff is you're perfectly good at it without being at all anything, uh, without being an environmentalist. Because environmentalists tend to be ecologists, right? They study the ecosphere and the biosphere. This kind of reason, no, it, it's out of context. It's a pure idea. And so he even thought humans have no direct duties to animals, right? Our reason is infinitely valuable and, and infinitely different from the natural world. So we have that. Um, that also justified colonialism because Westerners just happen to have their reason more cultivated or else they naturally have more of it, whichever. But that justified colonialism. And now we're into this, okay? So, so to what extent do you think people in your country are brainwashed by these um, points of view, these philosophies? To what extent do you agree with them yourself? And to what extent you know, have they been used? So I'm gonna let you take a break. And then after the break, we're gonna to go to Bentham's Pleasure and Pain. And then we're gonna to go to Singer's view of animal rights, which is based on Bentham's view. So take, um, why don't you take seven minutes? Is that okay? I have 9.59. Oh. What do you have? You have 8.59, maybe? So. Is it okay, Professor, to give 10 minutes? Well, I was going to give you two different breaks. So, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I was going to give you two separate. I got a total of 15 minutes. So, that was the. Okay, so go ahead, you know, um, take a break, walk around. Get something to eat. <laughs> And if you have questions, I'll just be here. Okay, I hope everybody's there. Um, I think it's been about seven minutes. It hasn't been much more than that, but I think I'll get started here on the next piece, right, of the puzzle. So one of the, another theme in my class is tragedy. People have good intentions and they make mistakes, serious mistakes. So I like to teach this on the assumption that John Stuart Mill and the utilitarians had good intentions. Um, Mill even understood that eventually we would have to um, become sustainable. We couldn't just exploit nature forever. But, you know, there was no uh, way of stopping it. Like, when are you going to stop it? How are you going to stop it? He just thought if people seek higher pleasures, if they get raised correctly, they will make good judgments about how to become sustainable when it gets to that point. Um, all right, so let's go to Bentham. Here's the next piece of the puzzle. If you remember Kant valued reason and that's why we have only indirect duties to animals. So it's all right to use animals as means to human well-being, right? We shouldn't uh, treat them brutally because then that brutalizes us. But it's okay, you know, to have to eat meat, to make clothes out of animals, to have pets as long as you treat them nicely. Um, all those things, right, that promote human welfare are okay. It's just not okay to be brutal. 
All right, that is not the view of utilitarians. They have just about the opposite view, right? So they, each of these sides in the Enlightenment are very extreme. Um, Kant tells you not to follow your inclinations, your pleasures or pains at all. All you should care about is acting on, with a good will, acting on the moral law, okay? So, so Bentham, and I, I said that last time. Uh-oh. Well, I hope it works. He said, you know, every, everything we do is motivated by pleasure and pain. That's it. There's no other choices. I don't know why this happens. Um, but I'll try to, I can go back to this one. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know why my machine has sort of gone, stop opening up documents, but all right. Well, let me try one more. Okay, if I can't, then I'll just I'll just explain it to you because I did talk about it last time. Um, okay, so the difference between Bentham and Mill was that Bentham said there's, there's no higher pleasures. That's your opinion. His main thing was you can just play push pin you can play meaningless games. Uh, you don't have to listen to, you don't have to like poetry. You don't have to like intellectual discussions. You don't have to, and then, you know, he didn't even emphasize empathy. He just said, as long as the pleasures you have don't harm other people, you can decide for yourself. And so, what happened in, in America is that John Locke's view of property. I have a right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. The government should just protect me from bad guys trying to take my property. And while I'm developing the property and giving it value, I can, I can have whatever pleasures I want because exploiting the land for human well-being is a higher pleasure, right? It's a pleasure that not only doesn't harm anybody else, it helps everybody. So being a hardworking um, creator of wealth through exploiting nature is virtue. That's a virtuous person. And then they spend their leisure time, I don't know, going to rodeos or whatever, uh, like Americans do. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt anybody else. And this is the good society. All right, so the, the point I wanna make here, and I certainly, all right. Anybody have a, an idea of what's gone wrong or I've never had this happen before. Okay. Um, Oh my goodness. I don't want I don't want to have to deal with okay. Um All right, I guess maybe it, that's why that it won't let me into the Okay, let me see. I'm Professor, you can turn off your camera, so do it. Turn off my camera. Professor, we can share if you if you can open it and we can share, we can open from the Google Cloud. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so now I just have to get out of that. Um, 
Oh, stop the share. All right. Okay, so. So how do I give you a chance to share it? Let's see, do I put you in breakout rooms and then you can share the screen? No, no, no. They can share it by themselves. You really? can just disable the participant screen sharing. Uh, you just enable it for us to share, then we're able to share. Okay, okay. so on participants. Um, okay, is there a screen share thing on this? I, I have all the participants here. So now how do I give you the permission? Ah, no. Let's see. I okay, it it allows you to unmute yourself. It allows you re, to rename yourself, but I don't have anything where it says um that you are allowed to no professor. I think your screen is already off. Yes. So they can share their screen. Oh, already? You can? Yes, yes. Anyone who wants to share the material screen as they can directly share. Okay. So does that mean um, you all can see see something that I can you all, do you all have some screen that you can see what Bentham said? Yes, we can just go to Google Classroom and open it, then we'll be able to see it. Okay, because I have a paper copy in front of me that I can look at. Okay, so why don't you turn to that, to Bentham? And, um, all right. Oh boy, <laughs> um, I apologize for this. I really, you know, planned ahead, had it all set up, but the best laid plans. Um, All right, I'm just gonna have to wing it. I guess I know, you know, in general what he says. So Bentham's idea is that what motivates us is pleasure and pain. And you can call it a sense of duty, but it's because you take pleasure in your duty. You can call it the religious um, sanction that God, it's, you know, I do what I do for God, but Bentham says, well, that's because you associate pleasure with going to heaven or pain. So it's really pleasure and pain that's motivating you. Um, then there's the physical sanction, right? That you can, you get burned if you put your hand over a fire. So that motivates you. And then the political is the threat of going to jail or the threat and then there's the social sanction, the threat of losing your friends or losing your status. So he just reduces everything to pleasure and pain. Um, now, the what I want you to turn to is Peter Singer's uh, Animal Rights. So that was one of the, the files. Um, so Animal Rights is... All right, do people have that? Have they, can you find animal rights? Yes. Okay, so if you look at Peter Singer, what he's saying is that every liberation movement, people are always uh, thinking that they're better than somebody else. So you had racism, sexism. Um, so every one of those movements people gradually expanded their minds and realized, you know, that the discrimination was wrong. And so what he's exposing on this one, and I'll just put you in your groups to explain it to each other, but 
instead of sexism or racism, in this case, he calls it speciesism, right? That you favor your own species. And he's saying that's illegitimate. There's no reason because what he says is that rights should be determined by your um, sentience, your capacity to feel pleasure and pain. If you have a capacity to feel pleasure and pain, then you are deserving of legal protections against people who would harm you. Um, so sentience is the, oh gosh, all right. So why don't you break into groups and talk about that. Do you think that animals should, well, by nature, they have rights because they're sentient. And a society that really functions according to the truth will give legal protections to animals. All right, why don't you, is that all right? Um, guys, you think you can handle that? Um, let's see, I, so I'll put you, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna have to repeat this then. Okay, so Peter Singer starts with Bentham's view. Bentham says that everybody has an equal claim to their interests, their happiness, their pleasure and pain should count equally. And their interest depends upon the fact that they're capable of suffering. So nobody should be um, treated in a way that would increase their suffering. Everybody's capacity to suffer uh, counts equally. So what Peter Singer does is he just takes that capacity and says, well, Bentham, you should have applied that to animals because animals are capable of suffering. If a being suffers, there can be no moral justification for refusing to take that suffering into consideration, right? If a being is not capable of suffering, then there's nothing to be taken in, into account. So suffering is the necessary and sufficient criteria. Um, so just like with race and with sexism and with gay rights, all those people are capable of suffering and it gradually the, they were liberated. You know, we started to agree that they should be treated as equal. Now, the next step is speciesism, that we favor, the, all we care about is the suffering of our species. But he's saying that that's ridiculous because we know animals suffer just the same kind of pleasures and pains that we do, right? Because we're a kind of animal. So the speciesist allows the interests of his own species to override the greater interests of the members of other species, okay? Um, and then he, Singer um, condemns eat meat eating because he says we don't really need to eat meat. We can live healthy lives without it. And so it's just a matter of our taste. So we're basically using other animals completely for our own unnecessary needs. Um, the suffering we inflict on animals while they're alive is, is an even clearer indication of our speciesism than the fact that we're prepared to kill them. In order to have meat on the table at a price people can afford, our society tolerates methods of meat production that can find sentient animals in cramped, cramped, unsuitable conditions. They're treated like machines. I don't know how much you know about factory farms. Um, they're really, really inhumane, okay? Um, also, uh, the same form of discrimination is observed in the widespread practice of experimenting on other species in order to see if certain substances are safe for human beings or to test some psychological theory about the effect of severe punishment on learning or to try out various new compounds just in case something turns up. 
So, yeah, I mean, we there we do use animals entirely as means, right? We don't seem to have any conscience about the suffering that we cause them. And uh, we had a psychology professor at our school and he said, I don't know if he was the one that did this research or somebody he knew, but they had this monkey who um, they wanted to find out which was more important for a baby, the cuddling or the milk, right? And so they gave, they experimented on this monkey. And so they, they made a cage that would feed the monkey milk. So the monkey got fed, but it was, you know, physically unpleasant. And then they got another, I don't know, stuffed animal, something that was very pleasant and cuddly, but no food. And I just thought, well, that's so cruel, right? That's so cruel to this monkey. And he was saying, you know, that the monkeys were breaking down psychologically. And I was like, that's awful. Um, Cause you wanna find out, you know, which matters for a baby as if, I mean, what are you gonna do if you do find out? I mean, I just, that just to me shows me that people will use animals for anything without any concern about their mental well-being, their physical well-being. Um, so that would be the, I want you to discuss in groups, right? On the one hand, do you think we are speciesist? How far do you think it should go? Do you think we really shouldn't eat meat because animals have a capacity to suffer and every kind of meat eating involves making animals suffer. Okay, or, and you can start writing some of this down and talk about it in your groups. Do you think um, small farms where animals are treated decently until they go to the slaughterhouse and that's done quickly with the minimum amount of anxiety, like they don't know what's going on. And um, do you think that's okay, as opposed to the factory farms where they're really, really mistreated in a lot of ways? Um, all right, so that's number one. Do you think that's, that speciesism is a problem? Do you think animals should get legal protections just because they are capable of suffering? Third question, do you think meat eating should be morally prohibited um, because of sentience? Do you think meat eating should be illegal because um, sentient creatures should have legal protections? Do you think um, experiments that work on um, cancer or Alzheimer's, but they harm animals are okay. Whereas experiments about mascara or making perfumes stay on long enough or really superficial um, goals like that, that's not okay. But if it's something that really does help human beings with some serious problem, that that's okay. And then the last issue, and I, you should, I would like you to talk about this, is that um, people like Peter Singer don't have any trouble with early stage abortion, right? Because in the early stages, a fetus doesn't consciously experience pain because their nervous systems aren't developed enough. So, so it's only at a certain point of development where the a fetus actually becomes a sentient animal, right? A sentient member of the species. So do you think that abortion should be legal and that that should be the reason why it should be legal, right? And then the last thing is, what are you going to do for people who are in a vegetative state, right? Maybe they, you know, they had some kind of accident. There are people in vegetative states, right? They're not 
conscious of any kind of pleasure and pain, suffering. Do you think it's okay to let them go, right? Unplug their feeding tubes um, and let them die, right? Or should we preserve human life in any way possible because it's human, because, you know, favoring species, our species, not any other species. Um, and one of the big problems with that is that at, in cases like this and in the end of life cases, our interventions are so unnatural, right? We just have many, many unnatural ways of intervening. But if, you, if your criteria is sentience, right? As long as people can suffer, they're still alive and we should try and keep them alive. What if somebody has a really uh, painful kind of cancer and they want to die? Are you going to allow them to die? There, in our country, there's a lot of fights about this. Can we treat other people? Can we treat ourselves just like sentient creatures? And when it gets painful enough, we just stop eating. Right. Um, so euthanasia, how, are, how do you deal with that in terms of sentience and how human beings should treat themselves and each other? Should, should sentience be the ultimate criteria or should there be some other special thing, right? Human beings are special and so they should be kept alive as much, you know, they shouldn't ever treat themselves as mere animals, right? Kant would just go crazy against that. All right, so is that enough for you? I hope so. I hope you've taken some notes and you have some topics to talk about. Um, and I'll put you in uh, groups again. And then, um, so I'll put you in groups for like 12 minutes or something, and then I'll give you another seven minute break. And then I'll start with Karl Marx. Um, any questions? No, Professor. No, Professor. Okay, so you think you can handle this, good. Um, Okay, I did finally figure it out. I finally got into my Google account, my AUW account, and I think I can get the documents now. So, um, so here's Bentham. Everything is about pleasure and pain, right? And um, this one is about animal rights. Sentience is the criteria. These, uh, the people who, okay, religious people, Kant kinds of people, and singer kinds of people really, really, really disagree, right? They vehemently disagree about how to treat animals and also how to treat people. And so people like Kant and religious people who believe in the immortality, the soul, whatever, um, really, really despise the secular humanists, right? The humanists who reduce human beings to just another species of animal and nothing else, right? Whereas uh, utilitarians, not all of them, some of them are higher pleasures types, but the singer types um, 
really don't like speciesism, right? And they really think it's wrong. Um, I had a friend who told me once, you know, the life on earth would be just fine if we just got rid of one species. <laughs> guess which one, right? I mean, it was okay with her to destroy the human species in order to preserve all the other ones. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what you think. I, I have friends who have very different ideas, right? They disagree with each other, but I would like you to, to write on your posts, you know, what do you think of speciesism? Do you think it's immoral? Or do you think um, it has nothing to do with morality? Do you think we we should we can treat animals as means to our ends, or do you think we can't at all? So the people like Singer, who um, don't like speciesism, they also reject. Okay, so they reject any kind of meat eating. They also reject zoos because zoos are set up for human enjoyment, right? Entertainment to make money, whatever. Um, and they and they reject experimentation on animals. I mean, if you take it to its logical conclusion, it's it's very different from the way the societies are structured right now. Okay. So that's for your post. I would like you to have a post about utilitarianism. There are many, many different aspects of it that you could write about. Um, and I'll just take a moment for questions. Do you have any questions about um, utilitarianism? I think I think we have time that I'm going to call on each of you to just say one point that sticks out in your mind about utilitarianism that you know you're going to include in your in your reflection for the day. So Shazneen, do you want to start? Can you think of one thing you know that really sticks out? Um, professor, I think in terms of um, happiness, pleasure, and pain, that can mean different things to different people because they have different perceptions. And so happiness to one person, uh, like how some one person would say happiness is, you know, good mental health. And another person would say happiness is having, you know, having enough money. So I think that would influence, uh, you know, their ethics as well because when they try to fulfill their idea of happiness and pleasure, you know, um, you know, it might, it might influence how well they protect the rights of others. And, you know, uh, yeah. I'm okay, sure. good. Um, and then you can, another thought is Aristotle also has a view of happiness, but it's very different, right? So, or it's similar and different, I mean, it's certainly different than Bentham's, for sure. Um, what about Sandani? What, what's one thing that struck you about utilitarianism? Okay. So if you, I don't know if you can hear me or what, but if you can, you can speak up whenever you your whatever your connection gets good enough. Okay, Mosa, what do you think? Uh, professor, to be honest, I, I didn't did that. I didn't have you know that much um, stable internet connection. I wanted to study study night and the electricity goes out. So that's okay. why I'm you know stop myself. Okay, I mean I was just thinking just from everything I've said today, is there something that struck you? I could say, <laughs> Professor, you know, I could say that this is psychological, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is not psychological. Uh, I just, you know, 
uh, I just want to say that, yeah. So person to person, like the happiness could, you know, differ. For example, like as a previous speaker said, like um, money and then other people can have good health and the mental problems, something like that. So that I could mention, but if I could go through that, so I could have more ideas, Professor. I'm really struggling. My opponent is Professor. Okay. So, Raihana, do you have a final take? Uh, professor, um, uh, I have one question uh, that you said uh, it is not fair for animals if we kill them. So why why um, human beings kill animals? Well, for food, right? So if it hurts them, so why they are killing animals? To eat them? Yeah. So do you think that they shouldn't? Do you think everyone should be a vegetarian? Yes, if it really hurts, for example, if someone come and kill me, it really hurts. See, my life also matters. Okay, so you think that just the fact that they suffer gives them just as many, just as the same rights not to be hurt as a person. Yeah, yeah, we should not kill them because this world, this earth is for everyone, for animals also. Okay, what about um, putting them through experiments? You know, where they're, some of them are. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think of that? Like cancer research or, um, you know, all sorts of research on different diseases. Yes, Professor, nowadays there are a lot of scientists who just, uh, do the experiment on animals to save a human beings life so it is also not fair for them okay so you're going to be you're going to be an extreme case of just leave animals alone yes professor when someone is sick so we should go for them and we should uh, do our treatment on them not on animals so it is their luck so they will come safe out of the treatment or not yeah, okay, I mean, you experiment on animals so that people can suffer less, right? So if you're um, trying out a vaccine and uh, it doesn't work, it makes the animal really sick, then you're not gonna try it out on a person. But if you can't try it out on an animal, you have to try it out on a person. Professor. Yep. I have the same questions, you know. For example, like if we talk about animal rights, right? So if we not consider that, okay, animals has the rights to life, to live their life, right? But the thing is that like, for example, like as uh, Rihanna said, I'm not just, you know, I'm just putting on that, okay. So for an experiment, the like cancer experiment or some other disease, which are deadly disease for experiment, if we don't use them, so should we use as human and, uh, should we use, you know, should we leave the that particular human to, you know, death, something like that? Right. As you are not. Right. So I was talking about this to a student once in my office, and I said, is it okay to torture animals for cancer, but not for mascara? And she just looked at me and said, well, there's always prisoners because they have no right. Do you think that's true? Um, prisoners? No, I don't think. <laughs> of course they have rights. She really, no, no, she of really course. thinks. Yeah, but she really thought they have no rights at all. Like you can torture them. Oh my goodness. This is their personal view, but everyone, if animal has rights, so why should, why not the prisoner have, doesn't have rights? Of course. Right. I, right because they did something that threatened other people, they're in prison, right? But they have all these other rights, right? They have a right to eat and a right to health. That's what I think. They yes, I, I think so, Professor, I agree with you. Yeah, but some people, some people really don't think they have any rights once they get considered guilty. So I do want you to think about that. Okay, um, Rossi, do you have a takeaway from utilitarianism? Um, I do have a quick takeaway in terms of um, the happiness, uh, the greatest 
Oh God. In terms of the great greatness happiness principle, because as a Buddhist, my parents always taught me to find inner peace and fulfillment in um in terms of charity and giving back and not take money and power as that main goal in life but i believe that money and power is also important in order for me to reach that end goal of where i want to be in terms of helping people and giving back because my main goal is to help improve the healthcare system in Cambodia, where I can incorporate natural medicines from trees and herbs and use it to cure people. And so if I don't have the money to start investing in my education, start investing in equipment and my research, then it will, I will have a harder time to gain that knowledge, to gain that, uh, to research about that connection between natural medicine and how I can incorporate that into modern healthcare and without the power to introduce my work into society people will not listen to what I have to share and then my work will be gone and it will be just a piece of nothing so I believe that money and power is also important and uh, it's like a stepping stone in helping me to achieve where I want to be, but it shouldn't be that end goal in life. My end goal is always clear and it's to give back and help society. So I, throughout my journey in life, I keep constantly reminding myself of the words that my parents teach me to not take money and power as that, to give it the utmost importance. Right. That sounds Aristotelian, right? You want to maximize flourishing. So you want to have some money, but not too much money, right? And money is for the sake of helping people flourish. Does that make sense? Yes, Dr. Bike. Yeah, okay. So that sounds Aristotelian to me because, um, but you know, utilitarianism, Bentham would say, well, that's your thing and somebody else's thing is something else. Um, but I think Aristotle is more demanding, right? You should find your talents and then cultivate them and make all that effort, right? Rational ambition, um, all that stuff. So, so when you have utilitarianism, it doesn't by nature make a lot of distinctions about rational ambition, rational pride, um, friendships based on some common good, um, sociability, sense of humor. It, it, you know, utilitarianism is just a lot more generic. And that was deliberate because it was supposed to be more democratic, right? Everybody's free and equal to define these things however they want, right? And so there's an advantage to that, but then there's a disadvantage to it also. People don't even try to have a more sophisticated idea of what makes them happy. So that's the problem. Um, Ramesha, did you have something on utilitarianism? I would like to talk about animal rights. Actually, okay. I think uh, people have different perspectives about it. Uh, uh, I think I should uh, do some research about it. Uh, when it comes to the animal testing, uh, I guess uh, it's okay to have animal testing for medical in medical field because uh, it's not only uh, for the betterment of human beings but also for the animals. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. You also, you know, have to do a research paper at some point. So if that's really a big concern for you, you can pursue that further. Otherwise, for a post, you know, at this point in the class, um, just compare Kant's point of view to Peter Singer's point of view, just so you get a sense of how radically different um, people are. Um, all right. Okay, so Jamie, do you have an opinion on utilitarianism? 
Yes, Professor. I do agree with uh, Raihana because we shouldn't eat uh, meat like our domestic animal that we raise them, we take care of them and then we eat. It's not okay. I don't feel uh, okay for that. Uh, were you raised uh, Buddhist, uh, vegetarian, or is it just something you've decided? <laughs> it's my opinion. <laughs> Okay, that's what you're supposed to do in college. You're supposed to decide, right? That you can examine all the customs and habits you're raised with that you didn't have any control over. So that's the whole point. Um, all right, good. Foreman, what do you think? Are you there? Okay, Shamima, are you there? Yes, Professor, I am here. Okay. Professor, actually, I want to talk about animal testing. Is it like, I want to know one question about, like in Bangladesh and other countries, there is the zoo where a lot of animals are there. And even they for those animals, they don't have any freedom, like they can fly and they can go anywhere. So... I want to know about it. Is it like same the killing the animal or is it like a stopping their freedom? Okay, so Bentham would say um, if it's giving them pain, right? Anxiety. Um, I mean, there's evidence that if you put an animal in a, in a little cage in a zoo, they really have mental problems, right? It's not... It's not natural. Um, yes, Miss, I want to say about it. Right. Okay. So you can comment on that. And then you can, if you wanted to do further research, you can. Um, I have a couple. Well, anyway, yeah, that's up to you. And another one is also like people are killing the animal for their diseases like for their sicknesses like for example is one animal i don't know i forgot the name and that if you if you eat their meat like this then your diabetes will be decreasing is it like the people people like think i forgot the name of the animal so it should be like if we can protect the people life at least we can do that way rather than I do agree, like killing the animal. Okay, so um, is that scientifically true? Or is that just sort of a... An no, miss, it is like people opinion, like people are doing like those things. I don't think is it like scientifically. Okay, all right. So do you think that should be illegal then? If like... It is really, if we can protect like the people life, then it should be not 100% legally. <laughs> okay, well, you can just work that out in your mind, right? What should be legal and what should not be legal? Um, all right, Kanij, Kanij, do you have something? Okay. Um, yes, Professor. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, but I was thinking about two things. One is uh, discrimination among people and also the animal rights. Because in our group discussion, we discuss among people and it was based on country, it was really different. Like uh, sometimes back in Cambodia, they make law that you can't kill cow or dog for meat and also it's same as sri lanka that you can kill the cow for meat but in bangladesh we can't like it's really normal here so i think based on sometimes in country and culture also make uh, good things or bad things in animal so in that case, I think that for me, it's really simple, like, oh, kill cow for meat. But for other things, it's really hard for them. And 
and I really hate that. I also think that domestic animals should not be killed by this. So what I think that uh, animals should have their own rights, like their place and their food. But then also we can think another thing that nowadays people are killing people over the power, right? Like discrimination among people. So it says it's democracy, we all have rights to raise our voice, but it's not. Sometimes if you talk against the government, then then you have to be like, like government will kill you. So right now people are killing each other for the power. So where's the animal? Sometimes I was thinking like that. Absolutely right, right can <laughs> Right. Right, Professor. People are killing people to have their rights, to have their, you know, to fulfilling their goals. And then how about the animals' rights? That's really, you know, to think about it, something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that this reading is trying to emphasize is what is a free and open society, right? What does it take to develop it, to sustain it? Um, what kind of education, what kind of attitude. So that's another complicated issue, right? Because John Stuart Mill, it's so clear in his mind, but Donald Trump, there's plenty of people that would completely disagree with that. And they would think that he's an elite person and he's just using all those reasons to justify taking control over other people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Professor, <laughs> I have one more question, actually. Can I ask yeah. that? Sure. So if you look, you know, around the world, we could, we could say that, like, for example, this is my, you know, just a uh, general example. Like, in India, you could say, uh, if you look onto that country, you could say that, okay, uh, cows are, you know, you can kill that, okay, cow. And not, you know, this is um, prohibited to eat cow's meat. So by my, my, you know, perspective on that, okay. So if you are, you know, if you don't have rights to kill that particular, you know, animal, but why should other, you know, for example, the, uh, you know, we are eating a lot of other animals, right? Um, yes. For example, the hen and a lot of things, right? Or it, or frying it and eating it. So how the people are categorized their animals, right? Because cow also have their life and then the other animals also, right? So I'm just thinking about that. Okay, how they categorize the animals, right, Professor? Because different countries, different, different, you know, uh, like, you know. Right. It's an old custom, right? It comes from Hinduism. It's just an old custom and habit. And that's where every generation has to figure out, right? What sort, of yes. customs, what sort of customs and habits do we really need to get rid of? I mean, we need to get rid of the use of plastic, right? <laughs> yeah, there's just lots and lots of stuff. If you re-examine it, um, you, you would give it up. But, and um, the thing that bothers me is when people defend something just on the basis of habit, because of course, as a philosophy professor, that's not a legitimate reason, right? You're supposed mm -hmm. to are just habits. You can easily change your habits and you know that you can. And so, you know, you need to have enough strength of mind just to get rid of a bad habit. Like that. That really annoys me when, especially college students, like you're not that deeply into your habits. But when I have students who'll just defend any, whatever they grew up with, I think it's really sad. Obviously, you know, if you're a philosophy teacher, you would think what you're choosing to treat yourself like a herd animal, except that herd animals don't really know that they have choice. <laughs> So you're just really abusing your own humanity. Um, anyway, so that I guess that's my response is that it's just it's an old custom, you know. Um, two, is that your name? Two, two, is it just? Yes, Professor Tubu. Tubu. Okay. Do you yeah. have a response? Yeah, Professor. I I want to talk about the utilitarianism. 
yeah, I, I do agree that what Raji said that, uh, you know, the in terms of the happiness, uh, like we need inner peace uh, by doing charity or any positive thing. And also I think that uh, it's also important like acceptance, like acceptance, uh, acceptance of what we are, what it is and what we should something like that acceptance is very important to get uh, to purchase that pleasure. Uh, yeah, we might have many challenges to do like uh, charity or anything uh, chasing for our happiness, uh, but we cannot get, uh, yeah, we cannot get whatever we want. So we, uh, I think acceptance is also one of the important things to pursue the happiness and uh, between the pain. Uh, yeah, that is about the happiness that I think, acceptance. And also another thing that I want to talk about is the animal rights that I think, uh, yeah, I think whatever, uh, it is okay, everything is okay to do when it is the right time and the right thing. I think everything is okay to do when it is the right time and the right thing. And because in, including eating animals, uh, yeah, actually, I'm not a very religious person. I'm a Christian. I'm not really a religious person, but I do believe in God and I do believe in the cre uh, uh, creation of the universe. And also, as our Christian religion's perspective, that God has given uh, the world, uh, the man, uh, God has given the world to the man to over and to use uh, their surviving for their consumption, yeah, those kind of things. And also I think about that the creation of like carnivores, like if we're saying that uh, animal has the full right uh, to, as human, as human, like if we think about like the ecosystem of uh, the world, like we have carnival, they need somebody, someone, something need in order to survive. So why, if we have those kind of uh, equal rights as human, we all have those uh, rights, then why this animal that is somewhat else thing? Yeah, if we think about that, yeah, because uh, so for all of that, I think that everything is to do okay when it is the right time and the right thing, yeah. Okay, okay. So I think you could say at this point that People ate animals in the past because that was their protein source. But at this point in time, we can easily get our protein and all our um, amino acids and all that because we've done all the research. So anybody could eat, get what they need without eating animals. Although in the past they needed to because they just didn't have access to all the sorts of options and the knowledge about those options that we have now. But anyway, the other thing I want to bring up to people is that next time we'll talk about Marx, but then we will start talking about religious positions. And the first one will be Christianity. And I'm going to have you reading Genesis. And then I'm going to have the Christian interpretations of what that means for environment. And then we have Hindu and Buddhist and Islam and African stuff. So we are going to go, we're going to go there in uh, when we have to, um, in a couple, couple days, actually, in about a week. So hold on. Um, so Raihana, did you have an opinion about this? Sorry, no, Professor. Okay, what about you, Poppy? Are you there, puppy? Okay. All right. So, um, main wrap up with utilitarianism, thinking about the Enlightenment project of trying to socially engineer a free and open society of mature adults using science to exploit nature and social science to mold human beings and create a new culture, a completely different 
kind of culture. And th they really believed this. They believed that the emotions in Homer, that human beings would be, be re-engineered, okay? Now, uh, that isn't the way it's turned out. Um, and you can think about, well, what went wrong, right? Where was the theory mistaken? Or do you think we just have to keep trying harder? <laughs> more science, more social science, and we will get it, right? So that's kind of the wrap up on utility. It's had a tremendous influence. Um, but now I want to talk about Karl Marx uh, because he has a different take on all of this stuff. Um, all right. So just in terms of the posts that I put up for June 9th, um, we're going to, OK. So for the next class, Monday, June 7th, that's, oh, yeah, that's today. It's OK. The second part is about Marxism. Um, and what does Marx say? So I did, I gave you the order to read the material. Start with the reading from the manifesto. I will discuss the historical and intellectual context and all that. So I do try to give you pretty specifically um, what I'd like you to do. Let's see. Okay, so let me go to the outline of Marx because this, is, this again is important because it's had such a tremendous influence on the development of global culture at this point. So what did he do? What was his context? All right, well, he grew up um, mid 19th century. He thinks he has the real final opinion of what is scientific and what is based on facts. Now, you know that today people disagree on what the facts are about just about everything. And um, during the Enlightenment, early on, people thought there would be disagreements, right? John Stuart Mill did not think people could disagree with them or bent them. But Karl Marx did, right? He, he agreed with the blank slate, but he said there's just one aspect of the environment that molds people, and that's the economic system, right? So he disagreed with Locke, Locke's notion of we're born free and equal, and that doctrine of rights is all socially constructed. It has nothing to do with people. Um, all right, he disagrees with Mill. We're molded by society. Mill's view of higher pleasures is just what his society valued. And also, it um, the people with higher pleasures were bourgeois capitalists, right? So it, he's just, Mill is just describing his economic system and his culture and calling it universal. And he's doing it to maintain power and privilege among the developing and developed, you know, all over the world. This is the British when they were um, building, they were the empire, right? Um, so Marx, economic determinism. Um, let me just ask you some questions first. Let me uh, get you thinking about this. Do you think, um, do you think that the way you think is molded by how you grew up, right? And you can, you know, I guess I can't wait for everyone to answer, but um, is the way you think molded by how you grew up? Were your experiences growing up? Yeah, Rosa, I think so. <laughs> okay. I guess you could take all these polls, but anyway. Were the experience you grew up with affected by the economic system in your country and by your place, your family's place in the economic system, right? 
is the difference between your grandparents, your parents, and your experience. Is that caused by the difference between the economic system, the, the way the system worked in their time and the way it works now? How much does economics determine all of your personal experiences, okay? Do you think the cause behind what we call international culture and philosophical ideas like universal human rights is, is the cause is because we have an international economic network or framework. That, that was the source of this belief in universal rights. Do you think the cause of the clash between the West and the Mideast is, you know, Muslims and Christians? It isn't about religion. It's about oil, right? It's just because, uh, because uh, let's see, Americans are want to be the dominant, the economic superpower, and they're getting threatened. And so they call it religion, right? A class of, of clash of civilizations. And they talk about how superior Christianity is to Islam. It's really all about oil. That's what Marx would say. What about the clash between the US and China? Is that a culture thing or is it, it's just money. That's all it is. Um, is the cause behind the economic systems, the growth of capitalism, right? From local to national to international. Is capitalism driving history? Because in order for a capitalist to succeed, they have to be constantly growing their business. So they had to go abroad. They have to exploit natural resources. They have to exploit human beings for the owners to continually create profit and to develop new products? Does capitalism reduce all other values to money? So women's equality, right? The only reason people value it is that women now can um, make as much money, they can work at jobs that are growing the economy. So all of a sudden, Women, the way the economy works means that women would, would contribute to the overall economic development of a country if they go out there and work rather than staying home. So all of a sudden we believe in women's equality and blah, blah, but it's just about money. Um, let's see. Do you think racial equality is not about values and not about being enlightened and not about culture? It's just about money. <laughs> when you had slavery, that was about money because it, it grew the economy, the cotton economy, right? You had free labor, but now that's not economically feasible. So now being anti-racist is trendy because we got to get people into jobs like computer science and all that stuff. And if you oppress people, then they can't make as much money and contribute to the overall wealth of the country. So it's all about money. Um, do you think multiculturalism and all this stuff is really all about money because the richest capitalists will make more money if they encourage people to get along with each other. Um, and it'll hide the fact that it's really about economic exploitation. No, no, we'll have these common values. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, the, the equality apart from sexual orientation the real cause behind that is that gay people are just as good at computer programming and all those other jobs. And so if we marginalize them, they won't make as much money and they won't grow our economy. So that's why all of a sudden we value them. Um, what about religion is the opiate of the people? It's like a drug. So when the economic system oppresses people and they don't have any hope, of developing their natural capacities in this world, 
Then they start fantasizing about another world and the people who are exploiting them feed them religion so that they don't rebel and try to make life better for themselves uh, in this side, uh, in this life. Does capitalism use religion to pacify the masses? Okay. Um, let's say, are they, do they use their cultural tradition um, to cover up their real motives, which is wealth and power? They present themselves as representing God's will in order to maintain their power and privilege. So for example, John Locke, remember, he said, God gave us the earth and God wants us to cultivate it. And so those lazy Native Americans aren't making it valuable. So it's okay for us to push them off the land or kill them because we represent God's will. And it also happens to be the way to get rich. <laughs> Okay, does capitalism destroy culture and replace it with an international money obsessed pseudo culture? I mean, are you part of this capitalist colonialist problem or trend or movement? That's what I want you to think about. Um, and, and, Karl Marx. So it would also explain in many of your countries, I think there are Marxist parties or there have been Marxist movements. And I do think you should read, I only gave you six pages from the Communist Manifesto, but I do think you need to read it and understand it. So you know why people are persuaded by the manifesto, why there are Marxist parties in the developing countries because the West claims to be superior and claims to be cultured and claims to be, you know, giving you opportunities to develop your capabilities or whatever it is. But really, Marx says it's all about money. It's all about capitalism. Um, the educational system is really a kind of brainwashing to promote capitalism. Um, and that's something, you know, that I, I know that you have to know English and you have to write English well. And I understand that that's a part of maintaining power and privilege. I just know that you can't fight it, right? Um, and, and so I do think you should understand that though. I mean, there's nothing inherently superior about English. It's just that people who spoke English happen to have the most control of the capitalist system. Um, and so that's why, right? It all has to do with money. The political leaders are slaves to capitalism. They have to, they're puppets of the rich because of their um, campaign contributions that the rich um, support anybody that will make laws in their favor. So, the, so that politics is not about justice or anything. It's just about having a system of laws, institutions, punishments, rewards that is driven by the richest people in the country to promote their interests. The rich control the newspapers and Facebook and all that other stuff. Um, Capitalism has led to the urbanization of life around the world, and that's increasing at a really fast pace. Um, so this is up to, up to number 18 is a diagnosis, right, of what capitalism has done to the human race. Um, and then starting with 19 is the solution, right? So Karl Marx, I think he's like a doctor who is very good at diagnosing a disease. Well, like you have the hiccups, right? So he puts a plastic bag over your head. Well, I mean, you get cured of the hiccups, but you get cured of a lot of other stuff too. So you can, you can agree with Marx on his identification of the problems of a free market, capitalism. But 
his idea of a solution is to have no free market at all, right? The government runs everything. So that's his idea, a revolution of the masses, takeover of all private property and the redistribution of all wealth, right? Um, so right now, in terms of environmental problems, capitalism has not has done nothing but exploit nature, and we have to change that system, right? Um, and the system is sort of like the sorcerer's apprentice, uh, sorcerer's apprentice. Like you can't stop it. How do you stop it? And we have a, a couple articles about that. How? Ca the international capitalist system is designed to exploit nature. Um, that's why I wanted you to read John Locke. That's why I wanted you to read the stuff that you've read. I know it seems unpleasant, but it's so important because if you don't know John Locke's view of property and the way that it gets attached to democracy, you're not going to understand how difficult it is to change the whole system. Um, okay, in the past, it's always been you're successful if you grow your business, right? Whatever it is, you sell something that someone else will buy and you're successful, your business grows. But that just involved exploiting natural resources forever, right? There was no limit. So that's the first set of questions. Um, and then the outline of Marx is that he, he thinks everything is determined by an economic system. Um, he disagreed with Adam Smith. Um, Adam Smith thought the division of labor was good because you could make a whole lot more stuff. But Karl Marx thought it was bad because it just makes people, it dehumanizes people. People are just an extension of a machine. Okay, he has this concept of alienated labor. All right, so how many of you have had a job where you work really hard and you get all worn out and you know your boss isn't paying you what you're worth because your boss is making a profit, right? In addition. So all this labor is alienating you from your humanity. It's an alienating you from other workers because capitalism is competitive and it sort of pits people against each other. Um, let's see. It alienates them from nature because capitalism um, yanks things out of nature. And um, it's always exploitative. It's always evil because the workers never get paid the value for what they produced, right? The owner always gets um, the work, uh, some profit, some extra capital to invest in something else. And so money sticks to money in a capitalist system. Um, Locke, you know, that wasn't Locke's view. Everyone's free and equal and they just work hard and they become prosperous. Of course, he didn't want money to be invented because he knew it would be a problem. Well, money got invented and Karl Marx said, it's a problem. Um, all right, I'm not gonna go, okay. Capitalism creates a world in its own image. This is pretty much what I asked you before. Capitalism makes the family into an economic relationship. So I don't know about you, but in the US people, when they decide whether to have kids, when to have kids, they always ask, well, can you afford it, right? <laughs> So in the US, kids are really expensive because of the private sector. You know, there isn't, there's so much that parents are responsible for providing for their kids because our country doesn't tax people and then provide a lot of social services. So um, 
a family, it makes the family into an economic relationship. Families are uprooted to follow the job. Um, so capitalist corporations, they'll move you all over just, you know, wherever they want, whenever they want. And if you don't want to leave your extended family or your roots or some other value besides money, you just lose the job, right? So it's, it's all about money. Um, let's see, people marry based on class. So um, male female relationships are reduced to economic relationships. Um, and because capitalism keeps growing, what Karl Marx said is that it's torn down all national boundaries. You know, people shouldn't identify with their country because uh, it's all the same, right? The, the identification should be between the owners and the workers. And the workers need to recognize they're being exploited. And then they need to have a revolution, a worldwide revolution. And once the proletariat takes over, they won't, they will distribute power and wealth to everyone because they understand what it's like to be exploited. Um, so Karl Marx was thinking in terms of factories. So he wasn't thinking that the economy was going to make another big leap with the rise in technology, right? He didn't anticipate that. So what he thought was that you've got factories to the point where you can work 30 hours a week and meet your basic needs. And the jobs are not that difficult to learn, right? But now we have a high tech economy. People need to go to school a lot longer to get the high tech jobs which means the state has to support them in higher education or in education all the way along. And, and you can't have people exchanging jobs all the time. So people have to specialize. So when Gorbachev, the head of, of Russia, um, that when the wall came down, when he agreed to get, get rid of Marxism, he didn't say, he just said, we're going to change Marxism. We're going to adapt it because we need to adapt. You know, Marx didn't get everything right, but he still wanted to emphasize high taxes and high services. Now, what happened was a very few people in Russia got very, very rich. So there's a huge gap. But that was true in Russia before the Marxist revolution with the czars. Um, so the Marxist revolution equalized uh, wealth a to some extent, you know, it did have a, a function, but now they're, oh boy, now they're really back to their old ways of having a very few, very rich people. Um, then the next thing is the ruling ideas, like the philosophy, of every age are the ideas of the ruling class. So that's, you know, he would say John Locke's ideas are really capitalist ideas. And John Stuart Mill's ideas are really about the utilitarians wanted to take over power from the aristocrats. And so Marx would just deconstruct all these fancy ideas about religion or anything like that and just say, you know, Bentham said they're all about pleasure and pain, but Marx said, no, they're all about money. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. So what I say is that each of these people defines the highest good in a way that just happens to give them power, right? Bacon is, therefore, science should control education. Uh, Locke, these free equal adults, that's really capitalist owners in disguise. Um, Mill was really about a power struggle. Donald Trump is about a power struggle. Um, all right. 
So then, um, how, why is it, right? What about all these Marxist revolutions, right? Stalin. Um, so Karl Marx would say, he even said, that the Marxist said that he's not a Marxist. He was just in it for the power. And then, um, so this temporary dictatorship of the proletariat, right? The proletariat's gonna take over, abolish private property. Um, it didn't work, right? Russia, China, Cambodia, North Vietnam, right? What went wrong between the theory and the practice? And this is where I'm really interested in what students who come from these countries, right, have to say. Like from China, I know when I was in China, they said that the opening up policy, they say it's socialism with a Chinese character, right? It, they haven't abandoned socialism. They just have adapted it to the current situation. The same with Russia, right? Um, okay, so let's see, I guess the Marxist analysis of the social changes in our time is um, that computers and technology have become the dominant means of production. Um, so we've had this another wave of international economic development. It's created a new means of production a new relation between nations based on their means of production, um, a new age culture, right? That's less sexist, less racist. The new economy has created a new kind of marginalized class. Um, in the US, it's uh, the working class, people who could have got, used to get really good jobs with just high school education. They are completely, <laughs> out of it now, their standard of living has gotten way lower. And so instead of thinking of it just as economic, they think of, they cling to patriotism, family values, traditional values, religion. And Karl Marx would say, none of that is what it's about. It's really about money. And it's about the change in the economic system. It's left out some people that used to do pretty well, and they're, they're, it's created instability. Um, so you can think of this in terms of your countries, like the very fact, compare yourself to your grandparents in terms of how computer savvy you are, how much you expect that computers are going to play a major role in whatever career you get. So that's, that's Marxist analysis, is that economics is really behind everything. Um, let's see. All right, so the United Nations, right? It claims to be cultivating human capabilities, but, um, and then actually the Declaration of Human Rights is trying to synthesize uh, Western uh, values with economic. Okay, so the West, uh, Europe and the US focused on individual rights, whereas China and Russia focused on social and economic rights. And so the UN declaration includes the right to um, live as you like, the right to travel, the right to be protected by the law, the right, those are individual rights, but it also includes the right to a job and the right to fair conditions of a job and the right to women and childcare. So those, that's socialism and, or social, not socialism, but it's a more active um, engagement of, more taxes and more services. So the public realm, the political realm includes like childcare, healthcare, things like that. And those are considered rights. So the UN was trying to put these two together. Um, 
let's see. So um, there's the couple of pages on the on the manifesto. And then this one, all I want you to do is it has 19, 21 pages, but I just wanted you, wanted you to look at page. Um, you can look at these other pages because it is about capitalism at its worst. But the thing I wanted you to look at was the students from 19 countries demand an end to an economics curriculum that blocks progress, right? So again, as somebody coming from one of the developing countries, I do think you should think about, and a lot of you do take economics classes at AUW. And I would imagine that the classes at AUW probably are not, you know, they're not the same as the class if you would take it at, in the US. But I, I'm not sure, but I'd be curious to know, like, are you learning economics as if making money is the ultimate goal? Or are you learning it in terms of maximizing flourishing? in general, it would be a more Aristotelian approach. Um, and the cult of selflessness is killing America, but um, you don't have to read that. It's just that what I want you to see by the end of next class, the paradigm, right? So by the end of the next class, I, I I will finish the section on this Western, modern Western paradigm with Bacon, science, um, social science, the new social science, the doctrine of human rights, um, applying it to the world today, um, applying Locke today, um, Marx's criticisms of Locke, and when you read the manifesto, you'll see right away, he's directly criticizing people who believe in rights, right? Especially property rights. Um, Locke and Marx's response, applying Locke in the world today, the United Nations, uh, neoliberalism. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try and wrap that up. And then I want you to write a paper where you just, um, think about to what extent is your life or your, your uh, culture or your country affected by this paradigm of modernity the, and the way that was driving colonialism and then the Marxist response to it. To what extent is what goes on in your countries some combination of capitalism, utilitarianism, Marxism, and your own culture, right? Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever. So your indigenous culture. Um, I did have one other, one, I had another short, um, yeah, I had a student Give, a student at AUW gave me this, and I thought it was very amazing. Um, the source of the corruption in citizens arise, rises from years of habit and practice. To understand the current state of political virtues in Bangladesh, you have to analyze the colonial history, right? And so uh, it occurred throughout the colonized world. And then this is what he said. This is a British army officer. I've traveled across the length and breadth of India. I've not seen one person who's a beggar, a thief. Such wealth I've seen in this country, such high moral values. People of such caliber, I do not think we'd ever be able to conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of the nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. All right, I propose we replace her old and ancient educational system, culture, for if Indians think that all that's foreign in English is good and greater than they, they will lose their self-esteem 
their native culture, and they'll become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation. Okay, so that's what I want you to think about, right? To what extent have these ideas about rights or um, utilitarianism, happiness, or um, economic determinism, I mean, even Marx's economic determinism takes people's culture away from them. Um, all right, so to what extent has your country or, or Bang she's describing Bangladesh. Um, do you agree that this is a big problem or not? And so it's just something for you to think about, a new way to think about that material. Um, all right, so let me just um, ask if you have any questions. And then also I'd like to ask each of you, which point that I said sort of stands out to you about Marx? Just on your first, you know, just the first short lecture about it. Is there something that's shocking? Uh, Mosa, do you have something? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, Hitu, to, to, I mean, Tubu, do you have an opinion about this? Because I know when I was in China, go ahead. Oh, uh, Professor? Hello? Yep. Are you there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor, I'm, I'm here. Professor, your wife was cracking in the uh, period, so can you repeat it? Please? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So you're from China, is that right? No, I'm from Myanmar. Oh, Myanmar. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. okay. That's okay, too, though. I mean, you all need to think about, right? To what extent are, is Western colonialism trying to brainwash you and remove your culture? To what extent do your own leaders use religion and culture to oppress the people? To what extent, right? I mean, there's so many complications between the words people use and then the behavior, right? It's, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's what I want you to, yeah, I'm sh I would gather you've already thought about this some, but, I, but what I want you to understand is by the time you graduate from college, you should be able to see all these trends and the way that they play off of each other, right? At, very, and at various times in your life, you should be able to spot all this stuff so that you're not a sucker, right? <laughs> you don't get sucked into somebody else's agenda. Like you can stand back and figure this out. Who's trying to manipulate me for what? Um, and when you add also the women's issue, right? The way women have been oppressed in the name of God or in the name of this or in the name of that. Oh yeah, reason, Kant said women are totally rational. Um, I will say, one interesting thing about women is that Aristotle had a very sophisticated model of wisdom and women didn't qualify, right? Um, St. Thomas Aquinas had a very sophisticated idea and women didn't cut, cut you know, weren't equal. And then, um, and Kant, right? Kant has this, pure reason, and he doesn't think women are equally, have, have equal capacity for reasoning. He thinks they can't act according to principles. They're too emotional by nature. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, but the utilitarians, John, uh, John Stuart Mill was a, a big leader in the women's liberation movement, in the movement for the women's suffrage, women to vote. So he was very pro women's equality, but he, I mean, this, this 
group, this particular subclass of philosophers, they think that the way people think is actually no different from animals. <laughs> so if you let monkeys into the class of thinkers, I guess you can let women in too. So that, you know, women were never allowed into the group of equal uh, human beings until the definition of human being was reduced to something that basically monkeys do too. We just do more of it. So that's kind of, I think that's really offensive. <laughs> but um, Karl Marx would say, women were defined in the way that would promote the economic system the best. And so Karl Marx, um, he thought the family was just an economic uh, tool right, a way to pass on your wealth and to maintain this oppression. So that's why he wanted women working uh, equal, as equals and he wanted daycare centers. He wanted everything to break down the family so that people would relate to each other as equals. Um, so, you know, so the family was just, it was, you know, people talked about it as sacred. It's actually just about money. Religion, people would say, oh, that's so important. And he'd say, that's just about oppression. Um, and then nationalism, right? National pride. He said, forget it. It's again, it's just a way for the leaders in every country to maintain their power in that country. And so the proletariat should be able to see through all that stuff and create this international over taking over the means of production and then just handing it out in ways that give everybody that everybody truly becomes equal and they have leisure time they only have to work 30 hours a week because we can meet all our basic needs and then we can go fishing and we can spend time with our family and we can read and we can do all this great stuff um, in, this, in this utopian society. So <clears throat> people criticize Marx for being utopian, but Bentham was utopian, John Stuart Mill was, you know, they all, they really just did believe that they could re-socially engineer people. But that was all based on unlimited exploitation of the natural world. And we, even Marx, Karl Marx, he didn't care about the natural world either. None of these people cared. They, having a sustainable culture was not in the works. It just wasn't part of their worldview. Um, so I did want, that's why I teach this stuff in this class. Um, so Poppy, do you have any reaction, any quick first reactions to Karl Marx? Okay, Connie, Connage? I don't know how to pronounce your name. Shamim, Shamima, do you have anything? Yes, Professor, I'm here. This is take some time to unmute myself. I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, uh, no, honestly, I don't have any anything, so any comment. Okay. Um, okay, what about Shamima? Do you have something? No, Professor. Okay. Um, Foreman? No. Jamie, do you have something? No, Professor. Okay. No, Professor. Ramisha, did you have a reaction? No, Professor. Okay. What about you, Rasi? Um, I don't know. Every time I think of Karl Marx and um, communism, I always think of um the dark history in Cambodia of the Khmer Rouge and how it's not following what the theory is saying in terms of sharing and living as a community, but rather we see the flaws of 
it's just the people in power who's actually having the control and it's not really communism into action but rather their greed and their brutality um, ruling them because all that is happening in Cambodia is there's still um, class, there's still people being in the top hierarchy, killing each other, people not having enough food to eat and starving. And so I feel like the Khmer Rouge is an example of what it's like when the leaders are not following the theories and putting the theories into action. Right. They're just using the theory to gain power, as a matter of fact, right? Yeah, kind of like a scapegoat. Right. So the aristocrats, right, in these countries, there was a class of people that just kept inheriting. And so Marx's ideology said, we got to take over, right? So we are the people. So then Pol Pot, whatever, they were really in it for the power. But the language they used was, oh, we're, we're supporting the people, right? And, and so they're doing exactly what Karl Marx said everybody else did, right? That the capitalists did. And um, so his own ideology, his own worldview got abused in exactly the way that he was criticizing every other worldview. Does that make sense, Rossi? Yes, Professor. Yeah, it's it's ironic, but it's understandable because if the masses were feeling oppressed, then somebody who really wanted power and money knew what to tell them. And what to tell them is I represent the people, right? <laughs> uh, the thing is Plato explains that in his Republic, which is 2,500 years old, he says a strong man comes when his society is unstable and then there's no middle class, a strong man who's power hungry will come and he'll say he represents the people. <laughs> so what else is new? Um, so Mosa, did you have any comments on Marxism? What about Sandani? No, ma'am. What about Shaznin? Do you have anything? Yes, Professor. I was thinking, um, I get where Marx is coming from, like his goals for a communist society, but I think in uh, when it's in the hands of um, corrupt politicians, it can really ruin like everything. Right. Um, yeah, because governments can like, Right now they make they uh, they make use of it like you said they use it to their advantage. Um, I think politicians nowadays, even like especially in Sri Lanka, they care more about themselves than uh, the people, and they care even less about the environment. Um, all that like their power is just um, you know beneficial to them. Yeah. Okay. And so. In America, they talk about freedom and rights and all this stuff, right? It just means capitalist money. And in another country, they'll talk about Marxism and, you know, the people. And it really is just, yeah. So um, how do you be, how are you able to spot a politician who really does rule for the sake of the ruled, right? uses the power and money for the well-being of the people who need it. That's the question. But anyway, so for today, I would like you to catch up on all your posts, um, finish the utilitarian one, and then next time have some comments for small groups about Karl Marx. And I really am curious to know how much each of you knows about how, how influential Marxism has been in your country, because, you know, I, I know something about Indonesia and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, but I don't know a lot. And so I just assume, and Cambodia, but in Vietnam, but I just um, assume the students know more than I do. And I really would love to learn that. And I think the students can also educate each other about these things. And I do think that if you're a college educated person, you should know about your 
society's political history and political ideology and stuff like that. So anyway, okay, I'll see you in a couple days. And I've already posted the reading and the page numbers and everything for next time. So I got ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, any other questions? I'll just hang, hang around. No, Professor, bye-bye, see you. Bye-bye.